Thank you, Wayne, very much. Thank you, Linda, as well. And thank you, KSU folks. Go Wildcats! Which is not at all an inappropriate term to use when thinking about the kind of people who engage in civilian-based struggle at great risk to themselves. They truly are Wildcats, as I hope you will get a sense of from my remarks tonight. Now, I'm told that uh, some of you are here on an involuntary basis. Uh, and uh, therefore, my credibility as a speaker requires you to show voluntary attendance after the uh, prepared remarks are delivered, particularly in view of the fact that I'm a lot funnier in Q's and A's than I will be in this prepared text. Uh, uh, I do speak at a lot of different uh, universities and have and research institutions and elsewhere. And the reason for that is that although we do a lot of different things at the International Center on Nonviolent Conflict, we are about disseminating the understanding of how people can take power without using violence. And the ideas that explain how this happens, even though it's happened many different times, as illustrated in our television series, our book, and by many other people's books and documentaries, the way this happens is still not well understood. So we have a long-standing interest in bringing to the public our ideas. And the occasion of tonight's lecture um, for us internally and for myself was to reformulate how we think the ideas that are at the heart of this form of seeking power, re to reformulate, to raise to another level uh, an explanation of these ideas at a time of great peril uh, to the world order, uh, represented by what I think we're all familiar with. Um, so without further ado, let me give you the lecture. By the way, I should let you know that um, I don't want to discourage any really assiduous note takers, but after the conclusion of this event, there will be a, 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 a there will be copies of the text of the lecture available for you to pick up. And uh, um, but still feel free to take notes. Uh, that will boost my morale. Three years and three days ago, a violent nightmare was dreamt in broad daylight in New York and Washington. Nineteen hijackers, all civilians, born and bred in six nations ruled by dictators, killed 2,700 civilians on the soil and in the skies of a nation governed by its people. America has seen atrocities before, even here in Kansas, unlikely to be touched by terror in the future. Terror came to towns and farms in the 19th century, in the years preceding the adoption of the state's first constitution. Gangs of Kansans who wanted the state to allow slavery fought with gangs of free staters. One entire town thought to be harboring freed slaves was destroyed. People were hacked to death in the streets. The nation called it Bleeding Kansas. In the wake of this, a former congressman from Illinois, newly emerging on the national scene, Abraham Lincoln came to Leavenworth, Kansas in December 1859 and gave a speech about the meaning of the country's struggle over slavery. One onlooker noted that buttons were missing from Lincoln's shirt. Another said he spoke without grace. I would be tempted to say it was from someone from a cable news channel, but they didn't have cable news then. We have no transcript of his speech, but the response from those who listened was thunderous. Two months later, Lincoln gave essentially the same speech at the Cooper Union Institute in New York. That one was printed in the newspapers and catapulted him toward his party's presidential nomination. In the speech, Lincoln told the nation 
that those who thought slavery was wrong had to oppose its expansion. He said they shouldn't try to grope for some middle ground between the right and wrong, nor be frightened by what he called the menaces of destruction coming from those who believed in slavery. And in his text, he capitalized his final sentence. Let us have faith that right makes might. And in that faith, let us, to the end, dare to do our duty as we understand it. Lincoln's famous line foreshadows what the great Czech freedom fighter Václav Havel wrote in his essay, The Power of the Powerless, in 1979. Havel declared that all who live under oppression and do nothing to oppose it are living a lie. The lie that life is normal. But that all people have the choice to start telling the truth, beginning in their own minds. And that when they lived in the truth, the truth that they were not yet free, but could be, and enough people began to act on this truth and start resisting the lies and rules of the state, it would open up explosive and incalculable power in the society. Resistance to American slavery had begun decades before the Civil War but seldom went beyond the protests of abolitionists who lacked a strategy to make slaveholding harder. Lincoln was always less interested in taking a stand to make a moral point than in standing for something that might rally a majority and accomplish change. The historian William Lee Miller says that Lincoln had little use for the perfectionists, moralizers, fanatics, and absolutists of his time. So how did Lincoln live in the truth and open up power to change this nation? As Mohandas Gandhi did 60 years later, in rousing Indians to challenge the British Raj, Lincoln started by explaining the truth about oppression in words that all his fellow citizens could understand and that awakened their deepest sense of the country's purpose more than any other president before or since he taught America how to think about itself. Lincoln summed up what slaveholding meant in four words. You work, I'll eat. And around this simple description, he wrapped a larger political meaning. He called the battle over slavery a conflict between two principles, which he said, quote, have stood face to face from the beginning of time. This is Lincoln. One is the common right of humanity, and the other the divine right of kings. It is the same principle. In whatever shape it develops itself, it is the same spirit that says, you work and toil and eat bread, and I will eat it. No matter in what shape it comes, whether from the mouth of a king who seeks to bestride the people of his own nation and live by the fruit of their labor, or from one race of men as an apology for enslaving another race it is the same tyrannical principle. But Lincoln argued that for America, the conflict between these principles, the common right of humanity and this tyrannical principle, had already been settled once and for all in the Declaration of Independence. And that Americans had only to uphold both equality of rights and the democratic will for our purpose as a nation to be secure. Fusing these ideas to clarify the issue of his day, he said, the master not only governs the slave without his consent, but he governs him by a set of rules altogether different from those he prescribes for himself. Allow all the governed an equal voice in the government, and that, and that only, is self-government. So there is no self-government unless every person has the right to give consent, blacks as well as whites, women as well as men. Compare this concept of political rights to the ideas of those who launched the Confederacy. Its president, Jefferson Davis, who called African Americans degenerate, said his new government 
was founded on the principle that, quote, the Negro is not equal to the white man. And Davis boasted that it was, quote, the first government in the history of the world based upon this great physical and moral truth. But it was not the last government so founded. In 1933, Adolf Hitler lamented the defeat of the South in the American Civil War and said, quote, the beginnings of a great new social order based on the principle of slavery and inequality were destroyed by that war and with them the embryo of a future truly great America, Hitler said. And as we know, the Nazis metastasized that tyrannical principle into the subjugation of Europe and the Holocaust, only to be dissolved in American blood, shed on the beaches of France and the bridges into Germany. Americans vanquished the idea of oppression here, and we helped extinguish it in Europe and the Pacific 60 years ago. We began to redeem Lincoln's dream. He had said that the Founding Fathers had, quote, reached forward and seized upon the farthest posterity. They erected a beacon to guide the countless myriads who should inhabit the earth in other ages. He said that self-government was eternally right and that its expression in America gave hope to the world for all future time. Today, Three quarters of the world's nations are ruled by their people who have given their consent to governments they chose. Lincoln's hope has never been so broadly crystallized in fact. But the civil war of ideas that Lincoln framed is not over and the tyrannical principle now threatens life and liberty once more. In his book, Breaking the Real Axis of Evil, Ousting the World's Last Dictators by 2025, Ambassador Mark Palmer counts 45 governments in the world that abuse human rights and rule their nations without their people's consent, including all those represented by the 9-11 hijackers. For example, in Syria, the same party has held power for over 30 years, the regime helps fund the terrorist group Hezbollah, and the political opposition is underground. In Egypt, the longtime president has never faced a contested presidential election, and his government jails political dissidents and outspoken human rights activists. In the United Arab Emirates, there are no elections at any level, the press practices self-censorship, and trade unions are illegal. In Saudi Arabia, Political parties are illegal. The royal family rules by decree. There are no elections, and people can be arbitrarily arrested and imprisoned. In none of these countries is government based on the will of the people. But to three of these oppressive regimes, and to many others, the United States government provides substantial military or economic assistance. However often our leaders say, they stand for freedom. In too many places, they pay those who suppress it. But oppression cannot last forever. In 1848, when European monarchies were suddenly challenged by popular movements, Lincoln said, quote, any people anywhere being inclined and having the power have the right to rise up and shake off the existing government and form a new one that suits them better. This is a most valuable, a most sacred right, a right which we hope and believe will liberate the world. The people's right to resist oppression, which Lincoln extolled, also required having the power to resist, which he also knew was crucial. Until his time, violent insurrection was the only form of liberating power widely tried. About John Brown's attempt to inspire an armed slave rebellion in America, Lincoln said it was so absurd 
that the slave saw plainly enough that it could not succeed. And he went further, deriding the very idea of zealots plotting violence. Listen to what Lincoln said and imagine who this applies to today. An enthusiast broods over the oppression of a people till he fancies himself commissioned by heaven to liberate them. He ventures the attempt which ends in little else than his own execution. Since the time of Abraham Lincoln, there is not a single case in which a violent movement has collapsed in authoritarian regime and replaced it with a government based on the consent of the people. How then have we come to the point that three quarters of the world's nations are democratic? Some have been freed after wars begun by totalitarian rulers had ousted those regimes. Yet there is another force in history that has liberated millions in great ways. Forty years after Lincoln was martyred, the Russian writer Leo Tolstoy, campaigning for an end to conscription, predicted that public opinion would change the whole structure of life in the world, in the process of which violence would become superfluous, Tolstoy said. That actually echoed the American founder James Madison's insight that, quote, all government rests on opinion, that it cannot function without the people's acceptance. While working as a lawyer in South Africa, Mohandas Gandhi said he was overwhelmed by Tolstoy's arguments. Inventing a new way for his fellow Indians to fight against discrimination, Gandhi enlisted them in burning their racial registration cards and engaging in mass illegal border crossings, all of which derailed the enforcement of a racial law until it was withdrawn by the South African state. Gandhi had refined raw, negative public opinion into precisely applied political power. He went on to wage 20 years of campaigns against British rule in his native India, using marches, boycotts, and civil disobedience to demolish British confidence in the permanence of their control. Later, the Danish and other European peoples engaged in strikes and nonviolent sabotage to obstruct German occupiers in World War II. Applying Gandhi's ideas, African Americans disrupted racial segregation in the 1950s and 1960s in this country with sit-ins, boycotts, and huge demonstrations until the nation had to enforce their rights. Less than 10 years after that, Polish dissidents joined striking shipyard workers to challenge unelected rulers with a new free trade union, soon joined by 10 million Poles, undermining the communist regime's legitimacy and later forcing free elections. In the same decade, Filipinos fielded the People Power Movement against the corrupt autocratic president, Ferdinand Marcos, splitting the loyalty of his military and forcing him out. Also in the 1980s, black South Africans, creating hundreds of, of civic groups in townships and villages, called strikes and boycotts to make their country ungovernable, as they said it was their objective to do, sundering the apartheid system. As that happened, a nonviolent civilian-based movement in Chile shook off the fear of a military junta, created space for regular protests, and won a plebiscite staged by General Augusto Pinochet, the president, the result of which divided his generals and forced him to resign. The next year, millions in East Germany, Czechoslovakia, and other East European nations besieged the boulevards of their cities and evicted ruling parties in a matter of weeks. In Mongolia, the following year, student-led protests forced free elections. And at the end of the 1990s, Serbian students galvanized the opposition to Slobodan Milosevic, generating a unified campaign capped by a million Serbs converging on Belgrade until soldiers refused orders to crack down and the dictator had to go. Today, the makings of similar movements can be found in Iran, Ukraine, Belarus, and Zimbabwe. Civilian-based groups using nonviolent tactics are active in Hong Kong, Tibet, Burma, 
West Papua, and the Palestinian territories. Civilian opposition and dissidents are present in Azerbaijan, Uzbekistan, and other Central Asian autocracies, and also in Egypt, Tunisia, Morocco, and other Arab nations. And the preconditions for clandestine resistance and self-organizing are detectable even in North Korea. In only one or two of these struggles today have certain groups adopted nonviolence as a moral preference. Most have chosen nonviolent tactics because they realized that violence would be futile, or because ordinary people could not otherwise participate, which would have sacrificed the full resistance of the population. Nonviolent movements that succeed in bringing down dictators do not abhor conflict or yearn for peace. They want to recast or abort political systems that have tortured and killed people. All these nonviolent warriors have grasped what Dr. Gene Sharp, the foremost living authority on nonviolent action, meant when he wrote, liberation ultimately depends on the people's ability to liberate themselves. The gratification of those joining a nonviolent struggle is not immediate. And the liberation they attain is hardly ever on the nightly news. Instead, it becomes a fact of history. The British thought they had defeated Gandhi after the Salt March in 1931, but they eventually lost India. The Polish communists thought they had beaten Lech Wałęsa when they dragged him off to prison in 1981. But he shouted at them as he was being arrested, you idiots, at this moment you have lost. You will come back to us on your knees. Seven years later, they did. Many nonviolent fighters seem to have nine lives. How is their endurance and the success of their movements achieved? First, the leaders of a civilian-based movement have to articulate clear goals that reflect the people's grievances and animate a sense of the injustice that they have borne. Gandhi, Adamichnik in Poland, Corazon Aquino in the Philippines, they all said essentially, this government is running the country for their own benefit. Why should we help them? Second, the movement's organizers have to recruit people from all walks of life to diversify its ranks and broaden the scope of non-cooperation with the demands and decrees of the government. And they have to unify the opposition behind the basic objective of ousting the regime, without which any particular political goals are unreachable. Third, the movement's leaders should develop a strategic estimate of all the material, economic, and political sources of the regime's power and devise and employ tactics that dilute that power. The great political thinker and writer Hannah Arendt said, it is the people's support that lends power to the institutions of a country. So when that support contracts and the people act to shred those institutions' ties to a regime, it cannot cling to power. Fourth, the movement should multiply acts of small-scale resistance horizontally throughout the country, straining the outermost ranks of the regime's repressive apparatus, and the initial tactics should be low physical risk to lessen the fear of participating by most everyone who doesn't want to be nonviolent, who doesn't want to be violent. Fifth, all stages of the resistance should remain nonviolent to ensure that the movement gains the upper hand in the contest for legitimacy. The regime will inevitably discredit itself with acts of brutality. And the movement needs to prompt the police and military to realize that they're not aiming at them, they're aiming at the top. Sixth, a campaign to sow doubt about the regime's future should be aimed at these policemen and soldiers to befriend them or soften potential rancor. The inner core of an oppressive regime is usually narcissistic and venal, and its armed defenders know that best of all. They may turn to an increasingly popular movement in a crisis when defections are conceivable. Seventh, yes, there are going to be nine steps. Seventh, the movement should seek support from abroad in the form of direct aid from non-governmental organizations and foundations, as well as foreign governments, so long as that 
doesn't bestow a propaganda benefit on the regime. And international sanctions should also be sought if they are targeted at rulers, not the people. Eighth, a movement must be ready for a last burst of repression. No when to pause to give itself the opportunity to regroup or be prepared to exploit an opportunity to negotiate, to obtain more defensible political space, if it needs more time before pressing forward again. In short, it has to know when to downshift as well as when to move into overdrive as circumstances require. Ninth, once the movement has gathered as much momentum inside and outside the country as it can reasonably expect, it should escalate resistance to force the regime on the defensive. If the dictator is ridiculed in cafes and classrooms, if taxes and fees go unpaid, if public administration is in disarray, if police and soldiers are demoralized, and if key industries are grinding down, then a dictator's system for keeping control is seriously jeopardized. His only real power derives from making his own people and the world believe that he cannot be ousted except through violence. Once that belief is destroyed, his end is predictable. Colonel Robert Helvey, the president of the Albert Einstein Institution, puts it this way, quote, a military victory is achieved by destroying the opponent's capacity and or willingness to continue the fight. In this regard, nonviolent strategy is no different from armed conflict, except that very different weapon systems are employed. What weapons? The truth told openly to counter official lies, the systematic blockage of official business by people who no longer comply, the courageous seizure of public spaces by the people for whom they were built, and the undoing of repression itself by people refusing to follow orders. Hannah Arendt translated the old Latin truism, potestos in populo, as without a people, there is no power. Lincoln framed the idea this way. Public sentiment is everything. With public sentiment, nothing can fail. Without it, nothing can succeed. Not even oppression. So the consent of the people is not just the only legitimate basis of power in a constitutional democracy. It is the fulcrum and agent of power in any society. Power is not only validated by the people, it can be wielded by the people everywhere. But here and abroad, that is still not understood by many who hold office, by most of the media that report on groups contending for power, and definitely not by those who seek it through violence. In his declaration of war against the Americans in 1996, Osama bin Laden charged the U.S. with, quote, carrying arms on our land in the Arabian Peninsula. And in his first statement after the attacks on 9-11, he said that America's allies, India in its occupation of Kashmir, Israel in its occupation of Palestine, placed Muslims in, quote, a large prison of fear and subdual, unquote. He declared that, our fight against these governments, addressing Americans, is not separate from our fight against you. In other words, Al-Qaeda and the wider network it has energized cast themselves as fighters against oppression. America is targeted because we are seen as bolstering their oppressors, not because they hate our freedom. In fact, bin Laden acknowledges that as he put it, um, the American people have the ability and choice to refuse the policies of their government and even to change it if they want, unquote, which is convenient for him. It's why he says that killing civilians is acceptable. But would-be liberators are out of business if they don't have movements. And those who sign up are invited not only to embrace a movement's goals, but also its strategy for action which is why violence is proclaimed by terrorists as the only possible path to power. Bin Laden, sounding like Lenin, has said, quote, the walls of oppression and humiliation cannot be demolished 
except in a rain of bullets, unquote. That, we know, is the voice of historical ignorance. And any movement predicated on ignorance is prone to failure. To expedite that failure, the vulnerabilities of terrorists should be discovered and targeted. And what is most vulnerable is their ideas. Right now, the market for their ideas is growing. The number of violent Muslim fighters targeting Americans is growing. We can continue to rely mainly on a military strategy to reduce the supply of terrorists and try to liquidate the market for terrorism that way, hoping our tactics don't backfire. Or we can work to shrink the demand for terrorism. And the demand comes from those who accept the terrorists' claim that only violence will remove the American roadblock to self-rule in Muslim lands. The case for terror is, however, built on false history, infeasible goals, and a form of fighting that only fanatical exhortation can freshen with new recruits. On history, bin Laden, for example, has declared that our democracy is for the white race only. Apparently didn't hear about the Civil War. And declares that the U.S. had, quote, no mentionable role in the collapse of the Soviet Union, which he attributes to the Mujahideen in Afghanistan, of which, of course, he was a member. Yet at the same time that he portrays the U.S. as cowardly and rotten, he implies we have decisive mastery of Muslims' fate. Two months after 9-11, he recited a poem on videotape, ending in these words, quote, We will not stop our raids until you free our lands. Until we free his lands? Not the words of someone who knows how to liberate his people with the power they already possess. So what is the heart of what his followers are supposed to die for? There is no heart. There is only a litany of disparate demands. Bin Laden insists that all Americans, civilians as well as soldiers, leave all Muslim lands, stop interfering with traffic and weapons of mass destruction, outlaw alcohol and gambling here in the United States, ban all images of women from our advertising, ratify the Kyoto Agreement, stop banks from charging interest, quit all other religions and adopt Islam, and stop, most, perhaps most importantly, stop using bad manners. Unless we do these things, he will destroy us. To accomplish that destruction, Islamist terrorist groups need a steady stream of fighters willing to die. And the lengths to which their language goes to reinforce that readiness for suicide approximates the jargon of a cult. In his declaration of war on America, bin Laden said that every Muslim has the individual duty to kill Americans in any country in which it is possible. A duty that all but a tiny handful of more than a billion Muslims have entirely disregarded in the six years since it was proclaimed. Indeed, the constant need of terrorists to re-legitimize violence reveals doubt that many followers can reflexively embrace it. So, bin Laden quotes Allah's messenger, quote, the best of the martyrs are those who do not turn their faces away from battle until they are killed. And he tells Americans that young jihadists, quote, have no intention except to enter paradise by killing you. But this empties the fighter's motivation of any political content. For if the only reason to kill is to be killed, the killer has abandoned all concern for the living. And whatever else it may be, liberation is not about the dead. All these spurious ideas and demented urges can be discredited. We should subsidize a vast, new, independent, educational effort with the collaboration of governments in the Islamic world to document in schools and on television the two centuries of our struggle, we're the enemy here, of our struggle to reform and revitalize American self-government so that all Muslims know that our dedication to rights, 
and a quality is embedded in our soul and more characteristic of who we really are than our government's recent patronage of undemocratic governments. And that patronage should end, not because it places us under threat, but because it is wrong. We can also undermine the culture of suicide in terrorist lore, not by denouncing it as evil, but by demonstrating to Muslims everywhere that it's not necessary, because the young people who kill themselves to attack our country, which is based on the same thing they prize, the right to govern themselves, can achieve that right without violence. Self-rule is not delivered by self-destruction. Muslim clerics who condemn terror are not in short supply, but they don't yet have an answer to the claim that no other strategy exists for Muslim peoples to gain the power they believe they lack. We can help them find that answer. The legacy and might of nonviolent movements, the strategy of civilian-based struggle. There are many precedents in the history of Muslim nations for this kind of conflict. I'll just name two. In 1929, the Pashtun leader, Abul Ghaffar Khan, founded his nonviolent Servants of God movement against the British in what is now Pakistan. He organized hundreds of villages and thousands of people to boycott state stores and lie down in front of police lines holding the Quran. In 1987-88, in the first Palestinian Intifada, tens of thousands of civilians boycotted Israeli products, marched in demonstrations, refused to pay fees, and inspired military refuseniks in Israel to split Israeli public support for the occupation. This year in Egypt, opposition parties boycotted parliamentary elections, and civilian dissidents against authoritarian rulers in North Africa are gathering force. The ranks of these and other embryonic campaigns in the Islamic world to open up closed societies and force governments to observe human rights are more numerous than the membership of terrorist networks because they stand for people living freely here and now. A young leader in the Serbian nonviolent campaign against Slobodan Milosevic, Serge Popovic, said that they succeeded because, he said, we loved life more. He said the regime's language smelled like death and that the people were tired of killing and desolation. Sometimes something obvious still comes as a welcome relief. People don't like death. So when bin Laden says death is truth, which he has said, he is upholstering the coffin of his own movement. When they happened, the atrocities of 9-11 galvanized worldwide support for the United States. Any equivalent terrorism against us in the future would trigger the same reaction so long as we are seen as loving life more than those who practice death. But the world so detests war as history's surest bringer of death. It may no longer rally to a nation that invades another, even in the name of liberation. Terror is less a form of war than it is a tactic of insurrection. To the extent it is supplanted by another, more effective strategy to liberate those who are oppressed, terror can be diminished. Terrorists kill people, and they must be stopped. But they won't be stopped until their ideas are. Their ideas are merely the latest shape that Lincoln's tyrannical principle has assumed. Because terrorists do not appeal to reason as the basis of rallying consent for a new way to govern, they would compel acquiescence by threatening death to enforce the agenda of themselves as, as self-appointed saviors. And that is why all terror, in fact, all political violence, is anti-democratic. For Lincoln, protecting the people's power was the greatest duty. For us, 
projecting the people's power, through encouraging the strategic use of civilian-based resistance throughout the world, may be our greatest opportunity because it can dissolve the oppression that gives terror its rationale and thereby divert millions from the lure of violence as the means of liberation. Thus, the struggle against terror is a political conflict, and the stakes are colossal. There are very few Muslims in the world who agree with bin Laden that obtaining nuclear weapons is a religious duty. But when the, when the materials needed to make these weapons may not be fully controlled by the major powers or the international community, the safety of millions is at stake. It can be said of these terrorists what the great scholar Harry Jaffa said about the Nazi and communist tyrannies, that they represent or threaten a rebarbarization of mankind. In 1909, Woodrow Wilson, then president of Princeton University, four years later president of the United States, spoke at a ceremony on the 100th anniversary of Abraham Lincoln's birth. He recalled the names of other great men born the same year, Darwin, Chopin, Tennyson. But you cannot pick Lincoln out, Wilson remarked, for any special characteristic. He does not seem to belong in a list at all. Instead, Wilson said, he seems to stand unique and singular and complete in himself, which made him, Woodrow Wilson said, a typical American. Lincoln, Wilson said, seems to have been of general human use and not of particular and limited human use. If America intervenes abroad to protect our security, we're using our power for our particular benefit. If our government uses military force and another people is liberated from a dictator, our power will be of limited but beneficial human use to them, although the cost is critical. Some say we should be proud that our forces freed Iraq and Afghanistan from brutal rulers. If we applied that strategy to liberating all peoples living under oppression and the cost followed a straight line progression, our pride would cost us $17 trillion and 100,000 American lives. We know that will not happen so a military strategy against terror is not really about liberation. It is about security, and it has to be judged on that basis. Only a global political strategy can pull out the roots of terror and rally support for general liberation. If Americans would organize ourselves or command our government to cover the world with the knowledge of how oppressed people can liberate themselves through nonviolent conflict, or if we were to help fund international institutions to propagate this knowledge, the cost of a facing oppression anywhere this worked would be radically less liberated person by liberated person and thus more realistic as a strategy if freedom for the world is actually our motive. We would then undeniably be of general human use. We would then be typical Americans in the sense that Wilson thought Lincoln was. One of our greatest poets, Walt Whitman, who revered Lincoln, was blunt about this. I say, Whitman said, the mission of government henceforth in civilized lands is not authority alone, not even of law, nor the rule of the best men, the born heroes and captains of the race, but higher than the highest arbitrary rule to train communities through all their grades beginning with individuals and ending there again to rule themselves. To work in the people, Whitman declared, this I say is what our democracy is for, and this is what our America means. Who is doing this work today? 
Is it my colleague Peter Ackerman's son, a Marine lieutenant on patrol, trying to keep order in Iraq? Yes, because public safety is a precondition for democracy. And if we do not help bring about a government based on the consent of the people in that country after having invaded it, of what even limited human use are we to that people? Who else is working in the people? They include Daniel Serwer, the Director of Peace Operations at the U.S. Institute of Peace, who was instrumental in getting aid to the nonviolent student group Otpor, which was pivotal in undermining Milosevic. They include the filmmaker Steve York, now overseeing the production of a new computer video game that will enable self-teaching around the world in nonviolent strategies to defeat oppression. And they include people such as Veronica Martin, now working at the U.S. Committee for Refugees, who brings the voices of displaced people to policymakers, most recently by documenting human rights abuses against women by the Burmese military regime. These Americans don't wear uniforms and they don't carry arms, but they are certainly of general human use. That most of these liberators are civilians, not diplomats or generals or special agents, reflects another insight of Lincoln's, that what he called the struggle for maintaining in the world our kind of self-government is essentially a people's contest. And the ranks of liberators are not limited to Americans, since the ideas about the power of the people, identical to those of Lincoln, are fuel for their passion. Those whom I've met in recent years include the following. An Iraqi-born journalist returned to the country of his birth after long exile in Europe to edit one of Baghdad's uncensored, honest, and popular newspapers in the explosion of free speech happening in that country today. An Egyptian woman raised in Britain and now living in Berlin, working to help local activists throughout the Middle East fight government corruption. A young Belarusian student, a woman determined to help bring genuine democracy to her country and to use the ideas of strategic nonviolent action to organize the opposition. In the past two years, when the Belarusian woman and the Egyptian woman visited Washington, I took each of them to the Lincoln Memorial. The Belarusian had never heard of Lincoln. The Egyptian only knew that he had freed the slaves. Neither had read before his words inscribed on the walls of the memorial, saying that America was dedicated to the proposition that all people are equal, and to the great task of ensuring that the idea of government by the people would be preserved for all mankind. These were already their causes, although they did not know the framer. We know the framer, and we know the causes. And now we know the means of liberation that can consummate the causes, that we stand for these causes and fight for these ideas should be a central proposition that our leaders voice as the basis for America's engagement with the world. And if we help teach the people of the world how to liberate themselves with strategies of nonviolent power, we will do at least as much, if not far more, to protect our own security than we would by sending out new legions to kill new terrorists who will keep coming until their claim that violence can liberate is nullified. Since 9-11, some of our leaders have told us often that they are resolved to find and kill any terrorists who kill Americans. About that, as a motive for action, Abraham Lincoln might well remind us of what St. Paul quoted in the book of Romans. Vengeance is mine. I will repay, saith the Lord. Lincoln taught us what kind of resolve we should rather have in the wake of losing lives in a war we have been obliged to fight. In his spirit and in his words, Americans should resolve that our people lost on 9-11 or any other date will not have died in vain because we will act 
to help the two billion people who do not rule themselves to achieve a new birth of freedom. And that government of the people, by the people, for the people, shall be universal. That is how oppression will vanish, and with it, the hallucination of violence as a path to power. Thank you. Thank you. I'd like to make a remark or like to um, make a statement, not a speech. To what degree do you see um, people within the occupied territories in Palestine? Um, you know, we all know about the violent tactics that they've been using, but uh, what what degree are they working to develop nonviolent tactics that might be able to accomplish some of what you're talking about? Good question. Uh, there's a lot that can be done. It's a uh, tragic conflict, uh, if for no other reason than that they haven't uh, uh, recognized that this is a form of struggle is really perfectly designed for them. Uh, we've trained Palestinians. Uh, we've trained people to train other Palestinians. Uh, we um, let me let me sum up the opportunity. Uh, in a little anecdote, uh, there is a, uh, a young Palestinian uh, activist committed to nonviolent struggle who was in our offices uh, several months ago. And he said, you know, our, we, have, we have two fights. We have a fight with the Israelis. We have a fight with our own people who still believe that violence is the only way. He said, almost every day somebody comes up to me and says, what? You've got to be killing? You've got to be kidding. Nonviolence? The only thing that the Israelis understand is violence. And I... I I interrupted him and I said, you know what you should say to that person when somebody tells you that? Exactly. So why should we fight using something they understand so well? Let's use something they don't understand so well. That, in fact, is a significant strategic advantage that a lot of these nonviolent movements have had. They understand a form of struggle better than the opponent, which is always over-reliant psychologically and mechanically on violent weapons. Um, if there were to be a movement that enlisted the active participation of Palestinians from all walks of life targeted against this wall that is being constructed, and at the same time there ceased to be violent attacks inside Israel, the split in Israeli public opinion about the policies of the Sharon government would reopen, and there would be serious negotiations within six to twelve months in my judgment. Because there are the terrorist, the, uh, the suicide bombings have persuaded most Israelis that there are no responsible negotiating partners on the other side. They're responsible for the way they fight. If they fight with us against guns, you know, we'll come down on them very, very hard. My colleague Peter Ackerman uses this further anecdote briefly to illustrate this. Uh, it's as if the Palestinians and the Israelis decided to pick champions to engage in some sort of athletic contest, and the outcome of that would decide the struggle. And so an arbiter flips a coin, and the, whoever wins the coin toss gets to decide uh, what form of struggle, what form of athletic contest to use. The Palestinians recruit to be their champion, a 220-pound, six-foot-one uh, champion tennis player, 10% body fat. The Israelis recruit a 375-pound sumo wrestler, you know, 55% body fat. They flip the coin. The Palestinians win the coin toss, and they pick sumo wrestling as the way that they'll engage in the contest. So yes, it can be applied there. Yes, sir. Um, any form of change being brought about, be it through violent or nonviolent means, is going to take a long time. But for any sort of people that are lobbying for change with such a disastrous effect as Tiananmen Square in China, how do you how do you address that? How do you, how do you keep people from either giving up the fight altogether or saying at this point we have to start slitting throats? Um, part of learning uh, strategic nonviolent struggle 
uh, is in preparing those who participate in actions for the likelihood of repression, repression. And that preparation includes uh, what to do after the repression seems so complete that no further action is possible. Uh, what does regrouping entail? Uh, what can be done even on an underground basis when solidarity was, the leaders of solidarity were arrested? There were some key leaders who just didn't happen to be in the, in the hotel where they were all arrested. Uh, and they um, escaped and went underground and continued the fight very capably, actually, in lots of ways. Um, there, all I can tell you is that there are specific um, tactical courses that can be pursued by leaders and activists in a nonviolent struggle, at least in terms of enabling those who are in the movement not to be discouraged by mass arrests or... Now, if we're talking about uh, an exceptionally... Let, let me give you an example of what actually happened in history. It won't take more than a minute. Three minutes. In 1944, in 1944 in El Salvador, there was a military dictator who had ruled that country for like 13, 14 years. And uh, everybody hated him by the end of that period of time. Um, even the coffee growers who pretty much control the economy didn't like him. So a couple of coffee growers got together with a, a brilliant doctor and some activists and they succeeded in peeling away the loyalty of the Air Force, not really a very important part of the military in El Salvador in 1944, but they got the Air Force to be behind them and they got like a, a division, an army division, and they tried to stage a violent coup. But the dictator rallied the remaining divisions and um, won in a, in a military battle, a classic military battle. It was over in like a week. And after that, the dictator just started arresting people and lining up against the wall and shooting them. That had never happened before in El Salvador, and that really terrified everybody. So then a bunch of law students and medical students at the University of San Salvador said, what are we going to do? We're not going to give up the fight for this country. In, in Latin American, certain Latin American countries and many countries in Europe, universities are sort of sacred space. You can... In, in the, in, on, the, on the campus of a university, you can do things that are not al allowed in public space elsewhere. Maybe that's still the case. Anyway, uh, the, uh, they, um, there was one uh, law student who stood up at that meeting. He said, you know, the only way we're going to beat Martinez is, not, is by not giving him anything to shoot at. He holds power by shooting people. We've got to figure out some way of organizing people and taking action that doesn't expose us to gunfire. There was no internet then, but they, they knew about Gandhi, and they, uh, they came up with the idea of a general strike. The whole country went on a general strike. Uh, two months later, the dictator was gone, over the border. Nobody killed. So even in the face of what to Salvadorans felt like the most horrendous repression they had ever faced, people just being lined up and shot against walls in the street, you know, cowing the entire population. It only took a month for that civilian population to bounce back. Once, some very smart guys had a really good strategy and explained it to them. I tell you, when people have nothing left to lose, uh, and it's either their, their future is going down the drain or they feel they can do something about it, it's amazing, even in the face of repression, what can be done. Next gentleman. Um, my name is Opress Makafula. I'm from Zimbabwe. Good. In Africa. Um, I heard you touch about uh, Zimbabwe. Um, actually, what I've discovered, mine is actually um, a comment um, to do with um, the media. Mm. Um, I've discovered that uh, many a time they're not. I when I get to the, to the internet, to the newspaper, there will be so many things about Zimbabwe, and many of them will be negative. And um, because I've got a family back home, and I know what is happening, I know a way to get there. Um, I wanted to, to make a point to the effect that um, we would 
we would like, would welcome actually the media houses which uh, tell it like it is. Um, to tell the truth as it is on the ground rather than because what happens is uh, uh, the media houses in Zimbabwe, most of them are sponsored from outside the country. And um, as a matter of fact, you will, you will actually report like, you know, what the, your, your boss wants you to report. So many of the stories will be untrue, to say the least. So what the government will do, it will put, you know, if you like, a media house which will counter that, those, those allegations which are demonizing the, the if you like, uh, the dictator. But I know my, my president is not a dictator. But uh, actually what I'm saying here is uh, the, the, the media houses, the international media houses should tell it like it is, not to, to add some spies to what is happening on the ground, but really to say, to tell the truth. Thank well, you. thank you. You're putting your finger on a very important um, constraint and as well as opportunity for uh, civilian-based movements, and that is the extent to which they can get the oxygen of coverage. Uh, sometimes material support from abroad and, and moral and, and uh, psychological support is very important to, uh, to a movement or to the people of a country. Um, there are two problems with getting the right kind of media coverage. One is getting editors and producers interested in the country, which is the first and most important problem. And then secondly, to get them to pay attention to something other than two people shooting each other in the street. Uh, to get them to pay attention to uh, something other than um, uh, the spectacle of, uh, of, of conflict. Uh, and um, that is why we have an active media program and we meet with uh, editors and producers. One of the reasons I uh, do newspaper interviews or meet with editorial boards of newspapers or go on radio talk shows uh, wherever I go, uh, half the reason is, to t is to just so that the media people interviewing me can hear what I say because they have further influence over story selection. We're going to be doing briefings for the cable news channels. Uh, the most important thing is to be able to understand and to recognize what they see right before them so that they can report something which is going to change history, even though it may not be as sensational in the moment. As if, I'll tell you this, this is unrealistic, obviously. I'm not, not even suggesting this it, because it is news. But if all news coverage of terrorist incidents, uh, if, all, if there was no television news coverage, of terrorist incidents. The incidence of terrorism would be about one-tenth of what it is in the world today. Brian Jenkins of the RAND Corporation in his great book uh, called Inside Terror uh, says, names five things that all terrorist organizations want, the five components to uh, uh, terrorist needs or, 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 or expectations, why they do what they do. And the first three are attention, recognition, and acknowledgement. I don't have anything to do with getting power. So the news media is a great hindrance to coverage of countries like yours, and it, uh, but you know somebody has to try to bring them around. There are a number. There's a great organization you should look, in, look into if you're interested in this called Reporters Without Borders. It's headquartered in Paris. I, I met with them last uh, in June of this year. They do terrific work. They, um, their members are mostly independent journalists who uh, do a lot of reporting in conflict zones. And you can work through Reporters Without Borders to get coverage of stories that you think are important. Yes, ma'am. Um, I had a question regarding uh, the situation in Sudan right now where genocide is occurring, or it is said that it is occurring. I do not know really if the situation there is uh, as intense as it is portrayed in the media. But my question is, uh, the popular demand is uh, for a UN intervention to go in and stop whatever is happening right now. But uh, will what tactic should be employed there so that 
whatever we are trying to do to try to bring peace is sustainable. Yes. And those problems do not occur in the future. Right. right. In other words, uh, you can't just send an ambulance. You have to improve the health of the patient politically. Um, I got an interesting email from a colleague of mine, a Moroccan man who has taken training in strategic nonviolent struggle. Uh, he is now a UN worker in Sudan, a uh, temporary mission, uh, a longtime human rights activist he is. He sent me an email in which he said that apart from the, the current uh, violence which uh, this intervention is attempting to terminate, he said the, act, the Sudanese government itself, which is of course uh, autocratic and, and, and corrupt, he said is so hated by most Sudanese and uh, is so um, small as a regime. In other words, the, a the actual decision makers and the core group is so small and is known to be so small that he said this is absolutely right. Once the existing problem is out of the way, this is a, a country that's ripe for teaching nonviolent civilian organizing and mobilizing because there uh, is no shortage of Sudanese who know that part of the reason, the biggest reason for the country's misery is the way it's governed. So um, uh, I think it is applicable to Sudan, yes. Yes, ma'am. I always find it interesting how people comment on Abraham Lincoln, and with all due respect to Abraham Lincoln, we almost completely succeeded in genocide of the Native Americans of this country, who still really have very little place here. And I just wanted to make that comment. Um, the comment about the media in Zimbabwe, mm -hmm. also our media is in trouble. And just yesterday on NPR, a man from, a lawyer from the Santa Fe, Albuquerque area, commented that though they have 48 stations in that area, only five put anything of local interest Many are owned by Clear Channel. Our media is very, very slanted in what's being covered. And, well, uh, maybe slanted isn't the right word, but it's being more and more controlled by the corporate dominance. And as we have participated, yes, post 9-11, there was a great outpouring of attention from the rest of the world to our country who is suffering. But now, like you said, it's very different because it seems we're so bent on global dominance. And until we become one of the players of the planet instead of one of the dominators, I think people will continue to look at us that way. Well, you know, I, I don't disagree with you. I think it's self-correcting. The extent to which <laughs> the extent to which the United States uh, seeks to to do uh, what you describe as domination is the extent to which it will lose influence and thus power. So that in that sense, historically, it's self-correcting. Um, Lincoln um, had his hands full with the Civil War, uh, is not known to have said much about uh, policy toward Native Americans. He did participate in this short-lived Black Hawk War, which is sort of a non-war in southern Illinois. You may remember that he, he was, uh, uh, all the young men of southern Illinois were recruited to join uh, basically very thinly and badly trained uh, groups to uh, go to war against the Black Hawk Nation because it was actually, there was an overreaction. The Black Hawks did something and there never was really any fighting. And Lincoln's memory of the time, they spent like two or three months just drilling each other and there was one engagement. Some, they couldn't even find any Black Hawk Indians. And finally, some stray scout found one Black Hawk Indian who was an elderly man lost in the forest. And they scared the living daylights of this poor man, you know. And the young firebrands, Lincoln was the captain of this particular unit, and the young firebrands wanted to kill the Indian. You know, you know like a, <laughs> kill this elderly man, you know, he was lost in the forest. He couldn't believe it. You know, and he said, no, he said he had to sell a less aggressive approach to the Indian. He said, well, you know, he, he, he's not armed and he, he's not with anyone else. 
does he really represent a threat to us? No, we stand for humane values. We don't, we're not, we shouldn't kill anybody who isn't armed, right? And everybody else looked at each other and said, well, yeah, I suppose so, even though they were really anxious to drill this guy. So Lincoln saved one Indian's life, one, Ameri one Native American's life in the Black Hawk War. It is, but it represents his, it represented, I think, uh, him in a, in a larger sense. Let me give you, however, a recommendation of a book which has in it a fabulous chapter that I know you would absolutely love on the Native American experience. This is a book by the American um, philosopher Jacob Needleman, and I actually relied on it in part for this address. It's called The American Soul Rediscovering the Wisdom of the Founders. Uh, there's a chapter in there on Lincoln. There is a long chapter on America's need to reconcile itself with its actions vis-a-vis -vis Native Americans. And he has some beautiful ideas in that chapter. So look for the book, Jacob Needleman. Um, let's see, American Soul? The American Soul. Yeah. Sir. Um, I have a question. Some. Some would say that if we end our support, you, you mentioned the Middle Eastern governments, the governments that we're supporting, such as Egypt and, and uh, Saudi Arabia. Some would say that if we ended our support of those nations, that those moderate U.S. friendly nations that are trying to keep the peace would then fall and more deadly uh, fundamentalist mo Muslim governments would rise. So would you just say that we should stop supporting those governments and forget about our national security or should we? How would you go about I would not suggest that we stop support overnight, like, you know, on September 30th it stops and October 1st it's uh, whatever happens after that, you know, it's your business. Uh, but I, uh, but that government is not going to last. Uh, Mubarak is trying to um, groom his son to succeed him. There are not many Egyptians that are enthusiastic about this guy who was a playboy in, you know, Monte Carlo and, uh, you know, is uh, uh, a uh, very slick customer. Uh, who apparently has decided it's time to succeed his father if his father passes away. Mubarak's health has not been the greatest in recent years. Um, there will be a transition to some government that either claims it represents the people or actually would represent the people. In Egypt, which is a fairly well-educated society, I mean, there are many destitute people in Egypt, but there is a substantial and well-educated, what we would call a middle class. And there are, uh, there's a substantial academic community, there's a substantial student community. They're all very liberal. They're all, they would love to have some sort of a democratic system uh, that they could participate in. They are the natural allies, uh, the people who represent Egyptian civil society in a, a transition. So my view certainly is that the United States should um, uh, build down, to use an old political term from the 80s, uh, in other words, to, uh, to land, to reduce uh, gradually to zero the military assistance and the non-humanitarian assistance. I wouldn't necessarily um, terminate agricultural exports or even agricultural trade or agricultural assistance, food assistance, for example. But a, a new administration in Washington at some point in time is going to have to talk sense to the Mubarak government because otherwise it'll be a, uh, an auto da fe and somebody like the Muslim Brotherhood will come to power and you'll have another Iran. Tom Friedman of the New York Times has written several columns about this and he says the only question is whether countries like Egypt can make a transition to democracy without first becoming Iran and spending 30 years in a fundamentalist theocracy until the people finally decide, oh my God, this is worse. We jump from the frying pan to the fire. So you're right, there could not be a reduction to zero overnight in American assistance because that would give the wrong kind of encouragement to the wrong kind of potential successors. But there are genuinely pro-democratic forces in Egypt who we should work with. More than just Colin Powell making a phone call saying, you know, release that one political prisoner. That's penny ante stuff. We're talking about, you know, by talking sense to them, we have leverage because we pro provide over a billion dollars a year in aid to that government. That is leverage. Why should not that be used on behalf of fostering democratic development? Over here. Uh, would you categorize the patriots of colonial America as terrorists? 
No, not at all. In fact, the, the interesting thing when you look at the, I would recommend to you a fascinating book called A Struggle for Power by Theodore Draper, an historian of the American Revolution. And he tracks how in the 1760s and the early 1770s, what developed in America was a spirit of not cooperating with arbitrary edicts of British colonial governors. Uh, there were unbelievable political battles between the British colonial governors who were appointed by the crown and the elected uh, legislatures, House of Delegates in Virginia, for example, which wanted to do X and the governor didn't like it because it didn't comport with uh, the royal, the throne's policy, so he'd veto the act and the legislators would get all upset. They didn't know how to do protests, they didn't know any of these kinds of nonviolent tactics, but what developed was a spirit of resistance against policies being um, imposed on the colonies by the British crown that colonists themselves had to pay for or felt were just not consistent with the way that they wanted to be governed. So that prepared politically the people for what triggered the American Revolution, which were a series of new policies which uh, ec economically squeezed many Americans, including, by the way, American smugglers who were doing a terrific business from the Caribbean into the United States. But um, uh, when, the, uh, uh, when that revolution began, it really began in a way not unlike the way the Indian independence movement began against the British. It was nonviolent. You can make an argument that had the knowledge of nonviolent resistance been present in the United States then, it wasn't developed until much, much, much later, decades, 100 years later, um, you could have engaged the entire civilian population of the colonies, to all 10 million people, close to it, except for the elderly and kids, in a because they all would have participated, almost all of them, except for loyalist sympathizers, uh, in uh, such a resistance. Um, could a British military expeditionary force of 10 to 15,000 troops have stood against seven or eight or nine million civilians participating in a nationwide resistance movement? Absolutely not. So no, I don't regard them as, I wouldn't use the word terrorist, that would be a uh, pejorative word to use. Violent insurrection was the only form of revolution that was known at that point in time. You can't fault them for doing the only thing they knew how to do to resist British colonial power. I think though, had these ideas been understood, uh, they would have been applied and they might have succeeded, might have taken longer than the, the um, um, six years that the American, six, seven years the American Revolution, the Revolutionary War actually took. But, uh, uh, but no, they weren't terrorists. Yes? You've talked uh, quite a bit about how your uh, organization has educated people from other countries um, for nonviolent conflict. Uh, has your organization done anything to educate our government about nonviolent conflict? There are, uh, there are, um, um, how can I put it? Um, um, uh, little pockets of knowledge and uh, support for spreading uh, strategic nonviolent know-how around the world within the United States government, principally at the U.S. Institute of Peace, which does have international operations. It's not just a research organization. And uh, the National Endowment for Democracy. Um, the uh, two major political parties, international organizations, the National Democratic Institute and the International Republican Institute, have both paid for training in strategic nonviolent action in a variety of oppressive societies around the world. All of the entities I've just mentioned are independent of the administration. They're, they have their congressional funding. Uh, they do, they get their, they answer to various uh, senators and, and congressmen on the Hill, uh, a few of whom understand this stuff. But this is a trickle. Uh, it's not a cascade of support for civilian-based movements. I'm not so sure now that I would want the United States government to have the you know, Made in USA uh, stamp put on the knowledge of strategic nonviolent know-how. We've be recently begun to engage um, people in the Canadian government uh, 
uh, in discussions about what that government might do usefully around the world. They're, they're very interested. There are other governments as well that would be more interested. There is, however, no national government in the world which uh, has a large uh, department or bureau interested in and doing something actively. So it's not just the U.S. government which doesn't understand it. There really isn't any government which understands it. I know that Kofi Annan understands it. He's seen a force more powerful. Uh, he has had his staff people talk to him about this. Uh, there are people around him who we have, we have met with frequently. We have great hope about what the United Nations might do with respect to this. Uh, there are a lot of major human rights NGOs that are supportive. Uh, there are, um, so it's, it's building. Uh, and I, I'm a little ambivalent about whether our government should, should do more. Would you want uh, the CIA spreading strategic and violent know-how around the world? I can guarantee you there isn't anybody in that building who understands this stuff. Uh, but, um, um, uh, so, but they don't need to. You know, this is in rocket science. We're talking about what was the, um, what is the line from the Bible? A little leaven leavens the whole lump. Uh, you don't need a great deal to make dough rise. You need to introduce people who understand these ideas and know how to quickly share them. Uh, so uh, we, we do talk with policymakers. We do meet with them. They come to, uh, we go to the, in some cases, to the same Council on Foreign Relations events, and sometimes we're panelists and they hear us talk. And the, one of the problems that they have in understanding it is a problem spawned by uh, traditional nonviolence advocates who have for so long talked about nonviolence in spiritual and humanitarian terms that it makes, that's the, the flashing light that comes on when you talk, start talking about this with policymakers. They think principled nonviolence, oh, that's spiritual and religious crap, forget that. And they don't understand that this is a form of struggle for people with which people can liberate themselves. They can fight for their own rights. And so it's, that's part of the reframing, which actually was embedded in my, my lecture tonight, uh, that has to be accomplished for everybody, including people in government. Yes? Um, I've done a great deal of studies on nonviolence, even though it's not my major course of study. And I've found that most of the leaders or leading groups of nonviolent movements have been very educated including Martin Luther King, Gandhi, who was a lawyer, you know, incredibly educated people, the college students that, you know, rose up in Syria and both Chile. Um, so how do you suggest that we go about in mass education of the world right. and ourselves to, you know, get people to understand this? Um, I, you know, during my studies found that oppression is the basic child of ignorance so oh, how do we ignorance, that's it, yes. um, how do we go about educating the world on nonviolence uh, major task can be done we're involved in doing it um, I think that the um, uh, there are examples however of leaders who have not been extremely well educated I would ask you to uh, by the way uh, I should have said this earlier uh, there may have been some teachers who left. If there are any teachers here, if there are any secondary school teachers or spouses of secondary school teachers, uh, and they want a copy, a, a video cassette copy of our documentary, A Force More Powerful, take my business card. I will send it to you for free. Um, the uh, um, universities are supposed to have budgets to buy these things, but if if you're <laughs> And I have to defend. I have to defend Films of the Humanities and Sciences, which uh, owns the rights to sell to educational institutions. Uh, but my guerrilla action, giving video cassettes to secondary school teachers, I don't tell them about. Uh, the uh, we because we we've, we have a lot. We have a large supply uh, in our center. But uh, uh, if you twist my arm and you teach at the college level, you know, and you're importunate, you know, you know, maybe I can help you too. But anyway, back to what you're saying. Watch the segment in that series on South Africa. You will see emblematic of the larger movement portrayed in that series the actions of a firebrand young leader, M. Caselli Jack. He didn't get past the ninth grade. Very intelligent man. S since the uh, downfall of apartheid, has become a successful businessman. Um, you know, self-made guy. You know, uh, read a ton. Uh, 
So he wasn't educa educated in a traditional sense. There are actually, if you look at the second and third levels uh, at, in these movements, you will see people who have very little education doing very well with these strategies. As I said, it's not rocket science. It can be learned by anyone who is uh, 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 interested in ideas and interested in how to apply ideas. Um, also, it is a myth that nonviolent movements le need brilliant, charismatic leaders. Because you can't run a nonviolent movement by telling people what to do. You, you, have to, you have to train people so they know what to do on their own. The reason that nonviolent movements, as I uh, said in our book, do the work of democracy before democracy is open for business is because they, they have to decentralize decision making at a lower tactical level. So people down below in the movement have to understand what the strategy is and how to use tactics and how to make decisions. Um, and you can't force people to join a nonviolent movement. You have to persuade them to based on the rationale for change and the goals and objectives. This is no different from political organizing in an open society. And uh, the people at the top may be brilliant and well-educated in, in a lot of movements. Uh, but um, if that's all you had were brilliant people at the top, that wouldn't work. So it's not entirely reliant on education. Yes? Considering what has happened with the current situation in Iraq, what must the U.S. and its people do to gain support from other foreign nations and its people and to help with the liberation of the oppressed people in other countries? And I presume you, you don't ask the question in the context of what we need to do to get other nations to send troops to Iraq. That's not no, what you're asking not, me. Yeah, not in the context of adding military, right. just in the context of nonviolent support. Well, you know, I think um, if there were a, uh, a new emphasis on this, from Washington, there would be many, many willing collaborators. Uh, it would be a lot easier for the current Spanish government to get aboard uh, a new uh, nonviolent offensive against political violence all over the world, particularly since they've suffered terrorism themselves now. Uh, I had a very interesting meeting recently with the uh, head of the Washington office of the Friedrich Ebert Stiftung, which is a foundation in Germany, a very large foundation which gives support to democracy uh, advocates and human rights workers and other civil society organizations all over the world in Africa and Asia, over 90 offices. Uh, and um, the, this foundation is an outgrowth of the Social Democratic Party, historically, which is the governing party in Germany today. And um, uh, he said that Schmidt or Schmidt's people, uh, more likely, would be uh, terrifically enthusiastic about getting aboard some multinational effort to fund civilian-based nonviolent movements. Uh, so uh, I, I think that, that if there were, if we tacked in this direction, um, if there were a new administration you know, next year or, in, or another four years after that and wanted aggressively to pursue this form of uh, accomplishing liberation, keep in mind, it's not us doing the liberating. We're just transferring knowledge so that people can liberate themselves. It doesn't work if you try to do it from the outside. Uh, sometimes people come to us and they say, okay, here are our conditions. What should we do? And we say, I can't tell you what to do. You've got to decide that. You're the ones who are going to be taking the risks. You know, you're the ones who are going to be formulating the ideas and, the, you know, and, and expressing why the government is so unjust. We can tell you how it's worked generically. We can get into real detail about the strategy, and then you'll be able to figure out how to apply it to your own local circumstances. That's one of the beauties of it. It's never intervention. If it were intervention, it wouldn't work, because by definition, it wouldn't be indigenous. Uh, Americans can't go to a oppressed society and get people to join a nonviolent movement. That's absurd. Uh, we can, however, uh, uh, help transfer the knowledge of how to do it. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Um, for the uh, two-thirds of humanity that live in abject poverty, I'm just wondering if there's uh, something missing in your formulations where, why, if we're going to use uh, strategies of nonviolent conflict to create open and free societies, where is the discussion about how we, how we can create also equitable and just societies, globalized, not just procedural democracy and the right to vote, but also uh, substantive economic democracy? Well, the most, uh, the, 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 uh, the best 
force for uh, making a government accountable is a people which has the po political freedom or which has won the political freedom itself to organize and mobilize to force the government to be accountable. Um, you identify for me an autocratic government anywhere in the world and I will show you a corrupt government because a government that is not subject uh, to the will of the people however it's structured democratically doesn't have to be an American style democracy a government which is not accountable for its actions is a government w whose top people are going to create Swiss bank accounts for themselves and build themselves nice little villas on the seacoast and otherwise feather their own nest and there isn't anybody in a country governed by a, uh, a regime which is uh, greatly corrupt, which doesn't see evidence of that corruption. <coughs> so the, uh, one of the great inhibiting factors in economic development in uh, countries that are not, uh, that don't have governments that are accountable to the people is corruption, is the waste of resources, is the bad economic management that goes on. Uh, and so my argument would be that political liberation is an absolute, uh, is absolutely essential as an accompaniment to, if not a precondition for, genuine economic development on a fair and just basis. Uh, and uh, political liberty within societies is also not an enemy of local decision making, of local control of resources, and of uh, not participating in um, global economic commerce if, that, if the people of that country are not interested in participating. So I don't think it's a serial track in which you say, okay, you've got to get fixed poverty before you address problems of political oppression. Uh, my bias would be to believe that you have to fix political oppression before you're really going to address poverty on a systematic global basis. But both have to be done. And you're absolutely right, the genuine that holistic liberation, if you will, can't be accomplished without empowering people economically and socially, not just politically. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Last question. Um, I understand the basis of civilian involvement in political nonviolent action, but I was disturbed by your comment earlier about your ambivalence about um, educating United States government leaders, because it seems to me that by doing so, they would be more invested in educating the citizenship and providing truth in media um, regulations and so forth. Um, so that doesn't make sense to me because the, our leaders actually are. I wasn't ambivalent about about uh, uh, educating policymakers. I was ambivalent about the United States government weighing in with U.S. branded assistance to civilian-based movements. I wouldn't want the, the object of educating policymakers to get them suddenly to put Made in USA on new vast amounts of financial assistance to uh, nonviolent civilian movements because I think that would have a tendency to discredit such movements uh, in various places around the world. Uh, I am not ambivalent about educating policymakers, but we're, a, we're an organization of finite size and have finite resources. We have good resources, but they're finite. We have to um, run to daylight. We think it's more urgent and more important to figure out ways to directly transfer strategic nonviolent know-how to people who are now actively engaged in nonviolent conflict instead of waiting for people in Washington to be properly educated. We do do that, but we don't do that. Uh, it's not, it's not it, it, on our priority list, it's probably five or six. It's not one, two, three, or four. Just a function of limited resources. I don't disagree with you. Thanks a lot. Thank you all for coming tonight. I'd like to invite you to continue discussion in the Union Courtyard.